have the Ayatollah of Fantasy Rock and Roller with us today, Adam Rank. How are you doing, Rank? Um, you look great in person, and I uh, just can't wait to next year we, we can pack it full of 25000 How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. I didn't know it was Ball Guy Day. It was being ranked. I mean, how do you lose? This is the Dynasty Vipers Vipercast. And welcome to the Dynasty Vipers Vipercast. This is episode 141. And as always, we are presented by the Fantasy Points Media Group. And joining me today, as always, Major Caldwell, Tara Roberts. How you all doing today? Yo. Doing awesome. Oh, uh, uh, wait, what's going on here? I don't know. You seem to be playing with some kind of Darth Vader type thing you got going <laughs> on there, Major. So I'm going to give you a second and kind of talk about what we're talking about on today's show. You may have seen the title here, but on today's show, we are looking at players that will help you win your fantasy leagues. Anyone can tell you the players to draft in the first, second, even the third rounds. But today we are going to talk about our guys that are available after that third round that will help you get those championships in here. Hey, we're all about championships. We're all about winning. So, Dynasty Vipers, let's get at it. Major, you all fixed there on the microphone? Yes, I am. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so we are going to continue to work with that. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so joining us today, as not normal, is Barry White coming back here to talk a little bit of fantasy oh, football with yeah. us. <laughs> Tara loves it. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> This is going to be one of our more eventful shows here. Uh, right off the get-go, let's talk about some quarterbacks that are going to be difference makers for fantasy managers here as we move throughout the 2022 season. Tara, I'm going to turn it over to you here right away. Well, I would have given it to Major, but I feel if I let Major talk first, I may lose both of you. Are we here? So, yes. So there we go, Major. We're good now. So, Tara, who is that quarterback for you here? Um, well, you guys know me. Um, I love running quarterbacks, <laughs> guys with that rushing upside. So um, my guy, it's going to be Trey Lance, um, of course. I think it's, you know, this is a Jalen Hurts type of situation. But the upside is, is that Jalen Hurts, unfortunately, didn't have that kind of superior receiving core around him that Trey Lance is going to have with Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, who came on strong at the end of last season, has been getting good reports out of camp, finally, thank goodness. Um, and, uh, of course, one of the top tight ends as well with George Kittle. So he's got a great crew surrounding him. And then the upside of him being a rushing quarterback, we can look at his stats from last season. And there's not a lot to look at because, obviously, last year was still the Jimmy Garoppolo show. But we can look at a few weeks from him where he did play at least 50% of snaps. Week four, he had 50% of snaps and was actually QB 14 in total points, just on 50% of snaps. Kind of crazy. Week five against a very tough Arizona defense. It was ugly, but it was saved by the fact that he had 89 yards on the ground. And I think that's the key here with Trey Lance that we're looking at with him. He's going to have this good, solid floor from his rushing upside that's going to keep him from dipping below 15 fantasy points per game. So he's going to have a nice floor and he's going to have the upside of the rushing volume when you combine that with the touchdowns as well through the air and on the ground. I think it's just a good situation where he's going at a very reasonable, I think QB 13 or 14 in ADP right now. And there's a lot of upside right there. So he's a guy that you're drafting, you're able to snag later in rounds. Maybe you pair him up with somebody that's a little bit more stable, like a Matt Stafford that you're able to get later in rounds as well. And you've got a stable quarterback, an upside quarterback, and a great situation. And you got, the one thing we, we just found out here today, obviously, is Debo Samuel, he got paid. And a happy Debo means a happy Trey Lance, right? You can't yes. have yourself a disgruntled wide receiver going into the, the season here with a young quarterback. I mean, Trey Lance is not a rookie, but for all intents and purposes, this is his rookie season. This right. is his maiden voyage into the NFL. He had a little bit, a couple little trips here, a little bit of boating here on the canal, a little bit on the dock when he was never really launched into this 49ers offense like he's going to be unleashed here in 2022. Now, Major, we want to talk about quarterbacks that haven't really been let given that ability to let it rip. Who's that quarterback this year that you think could 
be given the go ahead to let it rip here in 2022. I'm on a bandwagon. I've been fighting it for the longest, but I'm on a tour bandwagon just for the fact that he will have three players on the field at any given time that can turn a small play into a huge play just off their speed alone with Tyreek Hill, uh, Jalen Waddle, and, and, and most Mostert. He, the, all, each one of those, he can do a check down and it's a touchdown. So he's going to have a lot of opportunities for bonus points and all that good stuff. All three of those guys are like the one percenters when it comes to fastest player in the league. And don't don't sleep on Cedric Wilson. I think he's going to have a, a quietly good season. Um, and I think that's going to take a lot of pressure off of Tua, and he's going to be able to play more freely because, again, you could take a quick slant into a 60-yard play or, or a check down to a 40-yard play. So he's not going to have that much pressure on him to be perfect. Um, and, and also we, you know, people talk about his noodle arm, but I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing camp video where he's leading, uh, Tyreek Hill a little bit on these 60 yard bombs. So I don't sleep on two. I, I, I think I'm buying in. I'm on a bandwagon. Well, you know, kudos to the Finns filmographer, right? Yes. I mean, earlier mm -hmm. in the off season, the guy probably got canned for that film while showing under throwing there. Yeah. Tua's accuracy has never been the issue. We've talked about this on previous shows. I mean, the guy's like 66% once the ball gets in the red zone. Now, Major, as a former junior college superstar there at the College of the Canyons, you've all heard the talk check down to touchdown when it comes to quarterback progressions here. Well, guess what? In Miami, a check down is a touchdown yeah, when you're absolutely. throwing to Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. So any given time, this offense can explode. It doesn't have to let it rip, but we're seeing Tua being – let loose here a little bit in training camp and the early dividends are looking fantastic. Now for me, that quarterback right now, he is Derek Carr QB 14 right now. Is Homer. Uh, Homer. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I'll be a Homer all I want. Carr was a good quarterback. We're talking about the 104th player kind of coming off the board right now. The QB 14. I've got him ranked at QB 11 going into the season here. Carr is a good quarterback last season. He was fifth in passing yards. 4,804. Fifth in completion percentage, 68.4. Second in passes greater than 20 yards. Fifth in passes greater than 40 yards. However, his big problem was not being able to get the ball in the end zone. He only threw 23 touchdown passes. Enter Devontae Adams, who's got a career 73 touchdown passes. Terry, you know all about Devontae Adams, don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> now, now, we also got to remember, when Derek Carr was his most successful, he had weapons on this offense. Michael Crabtree, Amari Cooper. Now, Crabtree and Cooper are obviously not there anymore, but you've got Waller, you've got Adams, you've got Renfro. You've got some good pass catchers here. And when he had Crabtree and Cooper, each of those receivers, they produced over 1,000 yards, and Carr was able to get himself some MVP consideration here. Now, I think Carr could have a ceiling as high as a top five fantasy quarterback this season based on the weapons that he's given with. If he can find some touchdowns, if he can find himself into that – 35 touchdown type range, which I don't think is totally impossible. I mean, it's a quite the improvement on 23 from the season ago, but if he can get himself into that 35 range and kind of limit those interceptions a little bit, I mean, top five, I think is a very plausible uh, spot for him as far as fantasy quarterbacks are concerned. He doesn't have that Konomi code that a Trey Lance has. He doesn't Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, those kind of guys, but what he has is weapons around him and we know he could throw the ball. So yeah, for me, Devontae, yeah. he's going to be able to achieve that that 35 touchdown and it's going to erase a lot of those interceptions. He's not going to have to force the ball as much. Um, I, I, I'm with you 100 percent. I think Carr is going to have a monster season. And I think it's the stuff off the field now. They've kind of got that. We, the, the Raiders were absolutely a crapshoot off the field last season. I mean, Damon Arnett, John Gruden, um, Henry Ruggs. I mean, these things all added up throughout the season. Derek Carr did a pretty good job navigating the ship to the playoffs, which not a lot of people expected. When you lose some – and Darren Waller was injured for a good portion that year. So you add all those weapons, Darren Waller back, plus Devontae Adams, who wasn't there last year. I mean, that's a lot of weapons that he gets to work with. And I don't think anyone's going to regress as far as statistically speaking. I think Renfro is going to be that PPR guy, that Julian Edelman, Wes Welker type player in this offense. Now, uh, running back position here, Tara. You want to talk about homer picks. I mean, we've got a couple homer picks coming up, but guess what? This is a my guys type show right now. These are guys that we love for our fantasy teams, guys that we will go to battle with, stand on the top of those mountains, plant that flag. Tara, who's that running back for you? 
Yeah, homerism or not, I, I'm obviously very passionate about both the Packers running backs and their fantasy upside this season. Um, obviously, I now granted, let me preface this with I am all in on Aaron Jones. So this is me saying that one of my guys is AJ Dillon is not a knock on Aaron Jones. They're both my guys. But for the purposes of this show, um, Aaron Jones is going a little bit too high for us to talk about. So I'm talking about AJ Dillon. Um Weeks 14 through 17, um, when he, <clears throat> when AJ Dillon was playing and Aaron Jones was in the lineup as well, Dillon averaged 12.1 fantasy points per game. So I think when we look at that, it doesn't sound impressive, but that's kind of a baseline situation that we can look at and say, here were two of these guys, both playing, both playing significant snap counts. Aaron Jones was being Aaron Jones. He was still getting work on the ground and through the air. And we've got this 12 fantasy points baseline that we can get from A.J. Dillon. If that carried over into 2022 exactly as it was, we're looking at a low-end RB2, which is exactly where we're drafting him for his ADP. But with ADP, we're, not, we're obviously not trying to hit guys exactly on their ADP. We want guys that have upside. But we're talking about that being his floor. And the Packers, they don't have a big presence in the past game now with Devontae Adams out. We talked about that. And they're going to be heavily relying on the ground. Aaron Jones is going to be playing a significant role through the air. And then A.J. Dillon is going to be playing a significant role on the ground as well. So I think he's a lock for RB2. But what I love about him is that if Aaron Jones goes down, this is a situation where you've got a guy who has top five upside. He's got usable weekly handcuff value. You can use him as a RB2. You can use him in the flex. And then in a handcuff situation, if Aaron Jones comes down, you're looking at incredible upside, league winning upside. This is a guy that you want to have on your team. You just like his thighs. Relax. <laughs> it doesn't you know hurt. This, this Packers team <laughs> is one of very few that have an opportunity to produce two 1,000-yard rushers in the same season, something that hasn't been done since 2009 yeah. when Jonathan Stewart and D'Angelo Williams did for the Carolina Panthers. And we know Aaron Jones' history. There's a good chance he's going to miss a game or two somewhere along the line here. Now, we know Jones is going to have easily over 1,000 yards from scrimmage based on his pass-catching ability, but A.J. Dillon is no slouch in that category either. Just because he hasn't had that production doesn't mean that he can't do it. We've seen that from time to time where A.J. Dillon can be a PPR factor as well. 100%. Yeah, then that's what the appeal of it. If he, you know, if Aaron Jones goes down. And I guess, and also, Aaron Jones doesn't have to go down for A.J. Dillon to be catching passes. He's going to get, you know, he's going to get three to four targets per game just by the nature of how the Packers use their running backs. They're not going to be relegated to... First down, A.J. Dillon. Second down, A.J. Dillon. Third down, Aaron Jones. It's not going to work like that. They use them in series, so you don't have to worry about them being phased into one particular set. So there are going to be – there's going to be pass-catching opportunities for A.J. Dillon as well. So we go from one split backfield there in Green Bay to another split backfield in New England. Major, who is your guy to talk about? Or is it split? Because I'm going to talk about my guy. <laughs> my Dre. Stevenson! You know, I love that dude, man. That's my guy. I think I found him out of nowhere. I like raised him up as a little pup, and now he's a man and he's taking over. Moran, he like he finished off this. He had a pretty good season in his rookie year, you know, 600 plus rushing yards, five TDs. But more importantly, he kind of split carries with uh Damian Harris. I know. You know, Tara's probably going to start getting stats and be like, no, they didn't actually split because <laughs> the ratio and hold the three, like all that stuff. We're not doing that today. We're just going all feelings, no fact. <laughs> but but <laughs> Ramondre is having a great camp so far. Everyone's talking about him. They saying he's like slimmed up. He's like rock solid. The dude is like out here um, showing off his hands on third down packages. Um and he's taking a bulk of the first team reps. So, you know, there is an opportunity for him to, to to take that running back spot. For some reason, I don't think Belichick is really too fond of Harris. It seems like he doesn't really, I don't know. He, he never really gave him the reins. It kind of gave him a hard time even his rookie year. But um, but we do know Bill likes to go. He likes to go with the committee uh, backfields. But I don't think they're ready to let Mac Jones loose just yet. So I think it's going to be a run-first offense. 
So Ramondre is, I, I think this is a potential for a breakout. And just remember who called it since like the beginning. I've been there with my guy. Ramondre. Stevenson! <laughs> <laughs> So, you know what, Major? I, I think you still may be a, a season too early when it comes to Stevenson. Now, oh, from what I've talked to, some well, people who have been following this Patriots team here right now, I think Stevenson is going to have a role this season. I think his thing that was hampering him last year was his pass protection. But as the season progressed, but week eight, week nine, you started seeing Stevenson get more involved in this offense. Now, for the Patriots, this offense is going to be very uh, game-specific on how they develop their game plan. That's just how they roll there in New England. Will they be heavy on the run? Yeah, some weeks they will. Heck, they ran the ball all but three times one game last season against Buffalo, right? right? So right. They, this is a very game-specific game plan in which the Patriots come by. Now, Tara, I know you want to chime in there real quickly. Yeah, you know, surprisingly, Matt, um, I actually am more on Major's side what? on this one. Now, gr now granted, Major, what? Madre what? Steve, air horn? Not taking what? Over. He's, he's not taking over the RB1 spot. Like, let's be clear on that. Um <laughs> Damien, no. Damien Harris is still the lead back. I could throw all the, you know, you mentioned the stats that I could throw at you, but I won't do that right now. Um, but, but what I really like about Stevenson is that you mentioned it. He is, I mean, unfortunately, James White's not coming back from that injury anytime soon. Stevenson has earned that pass catching role. And we've seen exactly what James White can provide. So we've got that as a solid base for Stevenson. On top of that, he is going to get work on the ground. He is still going to get opportunities on first and second down. He's going to get series as well where he's able to go first through third down. So I think this is a, you know, a similar situation to Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. And why I like A.J. Dillon so much is you've got a guy right here with Ramadre Stevenson who is going to have the usable flex value and be a high-end handcuff as well. So I, I, I love these kind of guys. So I think I'm I'm very much so in on drafting Ramadre Stevenson this season. As a flex? Yes. <laughs> I don't care what she – everything you said is the most you've ever said about Ram – I, I cried a little bit. <laughs> I'm happy you're late to the party, but Tara, hey, it's rumor. I'm here. not, dude. You know, I got, party party I got dynasty shares. Come on now. I got dynasty shares. You I don't think she's late, though. I, I mean, we watched, we watched Ramondre Stevenson get more run in this game here last year towards weeks eight and beyond. I mean, we started seeing that transition, him getting some more you play there, a little more trust from Bill Belichick. You guys are I doing do a Homer believe. Simpson moonwalk into the bush right now. You guys are I ain't doing no walk. You guys sound <laughs> so right now. much. I used to get so much venom and hate, and now it's kind of like, oh, yeah, we like them. Oh, oh, oh. come on, guys. That's yeah, because you were, you were wrong last year. But were you right last year? Were I was. Do the stats say that? Do the stats say it? You're going to make her pull out stats, Major. She's going to pull out stats. <laughs> and before she pulls out stats, I'm going to get to my running back here, Elijah Mitchell. Another talented player <laughs> on this 49ers team last season who battled injuries in 2021. Elijah Mitchell, despite playing in just 12 games, he just missed out on a 1,000-yard season there by a mere 37 yards. He did add 137 yards in the passing game to round off his total to 1,100 yards from scrimmage in just 12 games. Mitchell was also a top 12 back in fantasy points per game and yards after contact, which is pretty good considering, hey, last season we had him buried. Well, not we. Most people, not me, had him buried behind Raheem Mostert, Jeffrey Wilson, Trey Sermon. Can you remember those people that had Mitchell behind Trey Sermon? You guys are fools. Now, <laughs> San Francisco, they are still going to be a run first team. Last season, they ranked fifth in yards per game, uh, runs per game there, 30.4. And an inexperienced quarterback that possesses the Konomi code, Look for a lot of RPO type plays coming out of San Francisco. Look for a lot of zone schemes coming out of that too, which means, yes, Trey Lance is going to get his in the running game. You talk about that Konomi code ability, that's still going to be there. He's going to still have six, 700 yards rushing, Trey Lance is. Elijah Mitchell, if he can stay healthy, and that's a big if because we obviously didn't see in that first season. If he can stay healthy, you're getting the guy right now at RB23, overall 50th player being selected. You're looking at roughly – end of six, beginning of the seventh round, and a lot of these redrafts right now for Elijah Mitchell where he's going off. That is huge value. You're getting an RB1 caliber player 
as your RB2, RB3, that late in drafts. If you are a zero RB guy or a hero RB guy, Elijah Mitchell is a perfect selection for you in the sixth or seventh round. This is one of those guys that wins you championships. A player is going to give you top 12 production that you're selecting 50th, 60th overall in these drafts, 70th sometimes. I mean, that's why I'm all in on Elijah Mitchell this year, just because of where his ADP currently has him. You cannot tell me that there are 22 other running backs you would rather have for fantasy over Elijah Mitchell. That's true. I do, I agree, got stats. I know, I do agree with you. I know Elijah Mitchell is one of the nicest dudes like, ever. I got to hang out with him at the NFL PA pitch day. Uh, shout out to my boy Brandon Copeland. Uh, interviewed him. And he's just like down to earth, super, super chill dude. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really rooting for him. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan for real. Hey, this show is uh, Team Tua, and hey, we're all about Elijah Mitchell as well. So, hey, Elijah, this is an open invite to come on the show anytime you want. Open invite. We'll get you on here. We'll talk some football. We'll talk whatever else you want to talk about. So, hey, pro Elijah Mitchell, pro Tua. Who are you pro for, Tara, at the tight end position? Oh, at the tight end position, uh <laughs> There's quite a few. I mean, you guys kind of snatched up quite um, guys that I do like, but um, Cole Komet, very into Cole Komet this year. Um, you look at Cole Komet last year, and honestly, he just had a rough hand dealt to him. It was very unfair. He was dominating in snap counts. He had a great, you know, a very solid amount of targets. And for whatever reason of the insanity of the previous uh, regime in Chicago, they simply just pulled him out when they came down into the red zone. And that was Jimmy Graham time for some reason, but Jimmy Graham time is no more. And it is Cole Komet time. It is a new year, new Chicago and new Cole Komet. Um, you want tight ends that have those high volume targets. You want tight ends with high red zone efficiency. And Cole Komet has the opportunity to now be able to have both of them. Komet's going to be the second option behind Darnell Mooney. We obviously know that Chicago is not heavily investing into their wide receivers. So this is a very clear path to targets for Cole Komet. And he's also now going to be cleared open for those red zone looks as well. Last year, he was tied in 20. You know, think about this. The red zone opportunities add six touchdowns to that. Maybe just 15 more receptions. We're talking about flirting with a top five tight end. He's got the upside there. He just needs the opportunity. And I think it's finally going to happen for him this year. Listen, that whole situation in Chicago was an absolute crapshoot again. You're looking at guys like Jimmy Graham. And we, you talked about him. You mentioned him here. And I'm looking at the numbers. Three touchdowns. <laughs> Jesse James, the <laughs> outlaw himself, one touchdown. Jesper Horstad. Two touchdowns. Oh. Cole Komet, zero. You're talking about just... Horstead, Horstead, Jesse James, Graham. They're just a bunch of Jags, just another guys. I don't know if any of them are in the league anymore. I mean, that's where we're at. They combined for six touchdowns, and that's what you mentioned there, Tara. If you can give Komet those six touchdowns, you're now talking about a tight end who's flirting with tight end six, tight end seven when the season's all said and done. I'm also disappointed a little bit here because I left – Irv Smith Jr. for someone to select here. And I really thought, I knew Major was going where he was going, but I really thought that Irv Smith would have found his way on there for you. Maybe I misread who you guys selected. That might have been it. But, you know, I still had to give some love to Cole Komet. I know. I, I, I selected well. Irv Smith in the Scott Fishbowl just because of all the <laughs> terror talk. You know what I mean? So it's like, now you just go leave me hanging now? Like, what's going <laughs> I'm on? sorry. <laughs> well, one player that Tara certainly will not talk about is your next selection here at the tight end position. Who do you got? I'm going with Tommy Tremble. Like I've been on him, like I've been on Ramondre. These these guys are the people that I've, I, I like the sleepers. So I like to go deep and find people that no one's talking about. And I knew Tremble out of college is going to be on the field right away just because his blocking ability. Um, and he really didn't have a season to brag about or anything like that. You know, I'm not the numbers is not going to show. This is all projection right now. Um, but he quietly beat out uh, Ian Thomas towards the end of the season, and and he's listed as the tight end one uh, to begin camp. So uh, I think he has a lot of skills that they haven't even started to unleash yet. And with two unproven quarterbacks, the tight end or the tight end is really your best friend. They're there to protect you, and they're by blocking and with checkdowns and, and short yardage and safety throws. So. I can see him getting peppered with, 
you know, maybe 50, 60 receptions. I'm just going kind of way out for him from coming from where he came from. But just his ability to block, I think he's going to be the quarterback's best friend. And, you know, I, I seen it firsthand where quarterbacks will throw the ball to people that kind of block a little harder for them or hangs out with them a little bit more, becomes friends. It, it happens. So, um, uh, you know, like, again, this is all projection. I think Tommy is he can have an early breakout. You know, we wait for tight ends to do like, you know, third season breakout. But maybe I think the second season, I think he'll uh, be able to accomplish some sort of a let's say a mini breakout just to be on the safe side. As a Tommy Tremble truther, say that five times fast. Tommy what Tremble are you looking for in camp here? Are you looking for Sam Darnold? Or are you looking for Baker Mayfield to win that starting position? Because right now, all the smoke, all the mirrors coming out of Carolina right now is Sam Darnold is actually outplaying Baker Mayfield. Now, <laughs> that is what it is. But, hey, Sam Darnold, let's give him a little bit of love because last season, right. first four weeks, he He's was a man. viable quarterback. And right. then it just went off, right? But that kind of coincided with Christian McCaffrey kind of disappearing too from this Carolina Panthers roster. So if you are a Tommy Treble guy, who are you hoping wins out that quarterback position battle there right now? I think Baker Mayfield's going to win it one way or the other. I mean, it's kind of the feeling there, but I who think are you it's, a, it's, it's, it's a sideways move. Like whoever's in there, I think their game is pretty similar. Um, I think Baker will try to throw it down the field a little bit more. It seems like he has a little chip on his shoulder and he's always trying to prove people wrong, but I think Sam Darnold, you know, whoever control, whoever, who's ever the safest with the ball, I think is going to actually win that job. Cause again, they're both, their games are pretty similar. So whoever, you know, protects the ball and throwing it tight end is going to be one of those things. So whoever throws the tremble is probably going to be the guy who's the starting quarterback. So basically what you're saying is it's like shoveling crap from one pile over to another, going from Darnold to Baker Mayfield. Tara, I know you got something. The wheels are turning. I can see the wheels turning there. If you say one number, I'm muting you. (laughs) No, no, I, no, I'm not, I'm not going to speak on that. Um, Good for Sam Darnold looking. Good for for (laughs) Sam Darnold looking. (laughs) Okay ish. Uh, <laughs> <I'm looking laughs> okay-ish. Wow. I don't think he's hey, gonna you know what? Win that Everyone though. looks much better in shorts and a t-shirt when they're out there throwing the ball around. Isn't that the truth? Now, for yeah. me, I'm gonna talk about Major. You talk about you are all on Tommy Treble since the get-go there. One of those guys that I've been with for the longest time. Yeah. And it's kind of almost like hedge with Tommy Treble and this next guy, it's kind of almost like you're hedging your bet, right? If they don't break out. Yeah, they weren't supposed to break out. But if they do, we're going for a lap or two victory lapping with the exactly. horns and whistles and everything. I'm going to go with my guy there, Brevin Jordan. If you are looking for some value right now in your redrafts, how about a guy who's going on as tight end 30? You're talking about a guy going as a 240th player selected right now. And again, hey, I am loyal to a fault. And I'm talking about Brevin Jordan here. Not only is he like one of my dynasty mustache guys, He's also one of my top five fantasy assets for this Houston Texans team. Look, the Texans, they have plenty of holes they needed to fill at the last draft, and they chose not to be worried about the tight end position. So that's a little bit of faith that they're showing in Brevin Jordan. During weeks 12 through 16 last season, the 21-year-old Brevin Jordan hauled in 13 of 18 targets for 112 yards, scoring two of his three touchdowns over that stretch. Jordan has continued to gain the trust of his coaching staff as the season went along last season. And his 9.1 fantasy points per game from nice. weeks 12 through 16, that was better than tight ends Mike Gusecki, Evan Ingram, and Noah Fant. And Davis Mills, we know that he likes him. And Davis Mills is a accurate quarterback. In the 10 games that Davis Mills started, he was 68% completion percentage. And when he targeted Brevin Jordan, now listen here, when he targeted Brevin Jordan last year, that passer rating went up to 123.8, which was the third highest when talking about tight ends. So you know that that Davis Mills, Brevin Jordan combination is going to get kicking here in 2022. And we know that the Houston Texans, they are a very talent depleted roster. Talent is starting to come there. Players are starting to show up there. We've got some players, Nico Collins, uh, Brandon Cooks, Brevin Jordan, Davis Mills, Damian Pierce. Talent is starting to slowly be infused into this lineup. And we know that Houston Texans, they are going to face negative game scripts. It's just that simple right now. You know they're going to throw the ball, and I think Brevin Jordan is going to be one of the main beneficiaries of this thing. Heck, Brandon Cooks is still going to get – well, we'll talk about him a little bit later because he I love myself some Brandon Cooks too. But Brevin Jordan is one of those guys right now. What do you got to lose? 
tight end 30 right now. You can literally grab him as your third tight end in redrafts. That's like zero commitment to him right now with possibility to give yourself a solid high-end tight end too. And the way this tight end landscape works out every year, every single season, there is a tight end who rises from the ashes, a tight end that we do not talk about, whether it's Logan Thomas two years ago, Dawson Knox last year, Dalton Schultz. Every year there's a tight end that kind of creeps into that top eight talk. Why not Brevin Jordan? You got nothing to lose. Now, yeah, talk any, about nothing any tight to lose. end or any player who wears number nine, that was like my number. So any player who mm-hmm. wears number nine, they out- automatically are going to be ballers. So that's why Jordan is like, he's, he's right on track. I love myself some Jordan. He's got, like I said, he's got nothing to lose. As fantasy managers, selecting him, nothing to lose. Another guy who doesn't have a whole lot to lose is Christian Kirk. I mean, Tara, t- talk to us about him. Why is he one of your guys? Yeah, with all that money, he does not have a whole lot to lose. He won already. <laughs> he's the winner. <laughs> he is. He's the big winner who reset the market. Congratulations, Christian Kirk. Um, you know, I think we have to put the contract aside because I feel for some reason the contract and the fact that it's the Jags maybe like muddies the water because the ADP for Christian Kirk is absolutely ridiculous. Um He's definitely my most common drafted person. Every time I see him in drafts, I'm just like grabbing it up every single opportunity because he is literally a guarantee to outperform his ADP by a significant amount. Um, we're a little biased for some reason. I, I, you know, I, I, it's it's weird because we've got a guy who is stepping in as the unquestioned wide receiver one. Um, I know a lot of people do like Marvin Jones and I get that man, but it's, you know, he's creeping up on there in age. And as the season went on, man, Marvin Jones faded and there were other guys that stepped up and those guys should not have been able to step up. There's literally no competition. Marvin Jones, Laquan Treadwell, it was, you know, Jamal Agnew and LaVishka Chenault. Um, There's not a whole lot. We've got uh, Zay Jones added to the mix as well. So when you look at that core, It's Christian Kirk all the way. And this is the guy that the Jags intend to be their clear wide receiver one. Now, is he going to have that same type of wide receiver one? If you go over and look at the bills and you say, Stefan Diggs, if you go over, look at, um, I wanted to say Oakland, if you go over and look at Vegas and you see Devontae Adams, those are there. I can admit Christian Kirk is not the same wide receiver one, but he's a guy that I would put kind of in that opportunity to finish easily as a wide receiver two, leading his team. We look at him last year, he finished as wide receiver 26 in PPR last year with 77 receptions, 103 targets, almost just under a thousand yards, five touchdowns. And that was playing second fiddle to DeAndre Hopkins. Now, I know this is a very different offense, a very different quarterback, but we've got a brand new head coach and Doug Peterson. He's a proven coach, and I think he's going to be able to breathe a little bit of life into Trevor Lawrence and the Jags offense and put some pep into the pass game, and we're going to get a good situation where Christian Kirk is someone who you want to have on your team. He's going to provide a lot of value at a very low ADP. I think hey, you're not going to have any arguments from the panel here. I mean, Major's a big Christian Kirk guy. I believe in him. You talked about LaVisca Chanel there. You talked about Marvin Jones. Each of them had over a 20% target share in Jacksonville. There's no reason not to believe that Christian Kirk's not going to command a 25 to 28% target share in this offense. Anyone who gets a 25% target share in any offense is going to produce. These are guys that I want on my rosters right now, especially when you're looking at him right now in the seventh round. I mean, you're getting him in the seventh round as your wide receiver three. You just mentioned him last season as a number two option there for most of the season in Arizona. As a wide receiver, 26. That is a high-end wide receiver three, low-end wide receiver two. There's no reason not to believe that he can't find himself creeping up into that 15, 16 range as far as wide receivers are concerned because the opportunity is going to allow himself to be there. Now, a guy that hasn't had a whole lot of opportunity since coming into this league, in fact, he's only played 17 games in three seasons, Major, is one of your guys Is this the year that you could finally start talking about him in a positive manner? Every year you tell us this is the guy that you want. Is this the year he's going to be that guy? I really, I really hope so, man. Like I've never met Paris Campbell before, but I'm like rooting for him harder than I ever rooted for any player because it's just so sad to see so much talent 
like not have a chance to like show itself and it's just like wasted talent so um but yeah paris has been a camp all-star like and for his first three years of his uh nfl career like every season we'll see one hand catches sideline toe tap sw- drag swag we got all kind of stuff going on diving speed he's doing everything and then all of a sudden he gets hurt so once again paris campbell's balling out in um in camp so much so there's reports coming out that matt ryan's built like this really nice chemistry with him and they're like buddies on this field and he's throwing the ball pretty much every play so i think if campbell can manage to stay healthy for a season please somebody knock on wood like i I need this dude to like because i was out on my lab was it last i forgot what show it was i told i was out we had that one show maybe i think at the end of the year show I was out on pairs, but, yeah. but but just like that, I'm right back in. As soon as I seen one good report, I was like, oh, man, I still have him on all my teams and everything. Um, but he, I think he has an ability to be the comeback player of the year, and he can sneak his way in and be in a wide receiver two, wide receiver one if things go right because Matt Ryan still has some, some juice, and that receiver room is not um, – they don't have a, a true alpha yet. And I think Paris is the um, the veteran in that locker room. And I, I think he can have a chance um, if he can stay healthy. I think he has a chance, especially coming out of the slot with with, um, with the other two receivers on the outside. I forget their names at the, you know, right now. But uh, with Pittman and uh, 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 Alex, Alex uh, Pierce. There Pierce. we go. Sure, do you want to take this yeah. one or do you want to? Don't it's very rare. Not, it will be no it slander. It is very it will rare. Be no slander of Paris Campbell. <laughs> it's not. A, it's not the Paris Campbell slander was... here. I mean, you. Are, this is the first time I think in the history of the show that you got the you uh, the, <laughs> the synchronized eyebrow raise from both Tara and I at the exact same time. Tara, do you want to go in here? Or do you want me to take this one? I, you, you, t- I, I love me some Michael Pittman. So you, you go ahead and like seal the so deal. The fact that Major basically <laughs> said that there is no alpha in Indianapolis. He did it once. A, he's going <laughs> on for his wide receiver 13. What a different quarterback. It's yeah, the Carson Wentz. Quarterback. Got you the have limit now. <laughs> quarterback, and you're telling me that Michael Pittman is not an alpha receiver in Indianapolis over a player who's played 17 games in three seasons. Now, Major, I'm with you here. I think Paris Campbell is a great late round guy to grab with some tremendous upside if he can stay healthy. Right well, now, right. you're literally getting him in the 16th, 17th, 18th round of drafts, and I think he has wide receiver potential to be a third a wide receiver three this season i don't think it's going to be a wide receiver one i think he's going to struggle to get into the wide receiver two simply because indianapolis is still a run heavy team no matter how you want to look at it here and i think that if they do pass it i i do believe the coach speak here a little bit least when he tells you go out and get yourself naeem hines that's probably because they're going to throw it to him they're not going to run him he's not going to get the running game going here for Indianapolis. So they're going to throw the ball a little bit. It's going to be those screen passes. I think Campbell has value late round, but he, there is a definite alpha in Indianapolis, just like there's an alpha right now. He's in wide Houston. receiver one. And I think you're wrong <laughs> about this one, but go ahead. How? Oh, boy. <laughs> Tara, Tara, you Matt are and I are. <laughs> We're heated. We're heated. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Better on the same way. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Hey, <laughs> take this man right now. <laughs> we are talking about Brandon Cooks here, man. Wide receiver 24 right now off the board. Overall 60th player. I thought about going Darnell Mooney or Rashad Bateman here because I like both those guys, but I am all in on Brandon Cooks. Yeah. Yes, he's 28 years of age right now. I get it. He, you may consider him a declining asset as far as the age is concerned, but he is likely to see 150 targets in this offense this season. 150, yeah. 150 targets in this offense and flirt with top 12 fantasy production. I have him right now as my wide receiver 13. And I'll, I'll get rid of the, a couple of these misconceptions right away. One, Cooks, he's not injury prone. A lot of people keep talking about his injury history. Yes, he's had a concussion here and there, but he's played 113 of the last 117 games. That's 97%. I don't think I've gotten out of bed 113 out of 117 times <laughs> without aggravating something. Right. Second, 
People say that Cooks is not a true number one receiver. Again, that is false. In six of seven seasons, Cooks has produced a thousand yard seasons. And four of those and were with four different teams. You're talking about a guy who's produced thousand yard seasons with four different teams. Since 2015 major, only six receivers have more receiving yards. And I would not be surprised, again, if Cooks puts up 150 targets here, 112 receptions, 1,000 to 1,200 yards receiving. I think he has wide receiver one potential and is a true alpha in this Houston Texans offense and on a Houston Texans team that is going to need to pass the ball. Whether they like it or not, they are going to throw the ball. I agree. Woo! And they like it. Let's look, like, like, <laughs> I chose Trey Lance, but I really wanted to also put Davis Mills there because I am really in on Davis Mills this season. Um, and speaking to Brandon Cooks, one of the stats that I like to talk about is like we have a nice little chunk there at the end of the season where Brandon Cooks was healthy and where Davis Mills was, you know, established as the quarterback um, weeks 14 through 18. How many fantasy points do you think Brandon Cooks averaged? Um, Major, you go first. Twelve. Matt, what do you think? 24.6. <laughs> Let's split the difference. 18. <laughs> 18 fantasy points, weeks 14 through 18 with Davis Mills leading the offense. If he could do that for the entire season, I think it's a real possibility. I'm 100% with you, Matt. It's like that's a fantastic combination there. So we are just going to ignore Nico Collins kind of coming on towards the end of the season, right? We're just going to ignore Bevan Jordan coming on. Bevan Jordan coming on at the end of the season as well. She literally Nico's cool and all, but man. Nico Collins. Hey, I like Nico Collins as a late round flyer. I get it, but she literally just told you (laughs) eighteen fantasy points per game weeks fourteen through sixteen. If Nico Collins is coming on and Brandon Cooks is still putting up eighteen points per game. Give me that eighteen points per game. I bet you. I don't know. I don't have the numbers. I don't have the numbers right in front of me right now, but I'm going to tell you 18 points per game was probably in the top 12 through weeks 14 through 16. Nico and Jordan are both young guys. They were rookies. They are matured. They're like veterans now. So they understand football. They understand like what they got to do and all that is going to be spread out a little bit more. Believe me. But I do like, I do like Brandon cooks. Oh, but- now he's coming around. But it's not it's not the alpha stuff you're talking. Relax. Come on. Oh, it's alpha. <laughs> now, hey, we want to talk some flex here. But before we do, if you're still watching us right now, even though Major's been doing whatever he's been doing over there, <laughs> head to fantasypoints.com right now. Enter promo code VIPERS22, and that will give you 10% off that subscription today. Look, right here. I'll pop it on the screen one more time. Right there. Check out, hey, we're part of the Fancy Points Media Group here. We got a promo code. We want to help you win. We want to help you save some money. Let us help you here. Promo code VIPERS22, 10% off that subscription. Hey, what, what have they got over there? They've got rankings over there. They've got, you can sort them out by flex, wide running back, wide receiver, tight end right there on those season projections. So as we head into this next part here right now, we're going to talk about our top flex options here. Maybe a little extra player here to talk about Tara who do you got um by popular request of Matt I'm <laughs> going with uh Joshua Just Palmer you didn't want to do it <laughs> no. um is second to Christian Kirk is the person that I'm taking the most of I'm taking a lot of Joshua Palmer a ridiculous amount because he is he's a, free he's basically yeah, exactly. free right now he is my late round guy. And what I love about Joshua Palmer is that when you're looking in these, you know, in the late rounds, you want to look at guys that are not like, you don't want to be looking for, Hey, I can get, you know, I can get a solid amount of fantasy points. I want to shoot for the fences. I want to swing for these high upside guys. And Joshua Palmer is a high upside guy because he is in the chargers offense and he has established himself. He is the clear third wide receiver in that offense. Now he separated himself from Jalen Guyton and should Keenan Allen or Mike Williams goes down, which is, you know, it's a real possibility given the history with Mike Williams and given the age with Keenan Allen, even though I love both of them, Joshua Palmer steps into being a heavy target with Justin Herbert. And it's just such a high upside play that you don't often get with wide receivers. It's really tough to get wide receivers 
that you're going to pull off of waivers or draft very late. They're going to have the opportunity to be very high upside because it's just a lot different than the running back position where those guys can step in and be league winners. But Joshua Palmer is someone who, in the event of someone going down with an injury, can step in from a wide receiver perspective and be a league winner. We saw him have success um, multiple times last year where he put up um, easy double-digit fantasy points, saw a good amount of targets, had a good catch rate, caught touchdowns, which was the real key there. Every time he was able to get um, higher than a 60% snap count when um, he was able to kind of step in for injury, or I think maybe COVID was an issue last year with a couple of the guys. He caught touchdowns in all three of those games. So I think there's just such a high upside opportunity with Joshua Palmer. So absolutely, if you're looking at late round flyers, that's a guy that you need to be looking at. Joshua Palmer, addicted to touchdowns. Now, <laughs> the one thing is, you know I'm going to love myself some Joshua Palmer. I got him as my one of my dynasty mustache type players there as well. We talk about pairing running backs, Alexander Mass and Delvin Cook making sure you have that backup running back ready to go in, in the event they're up. If you're selecting Joshua Palmer, there's a good chance it's in that 18th round, right? He is a perfect pick. If you've got Mike Williams on your roster, that you took him in the fifth round, sixth round maybe, why not go out there and get Joshua Palmer? You know you've got yourself a secure option. Any piece of this L.A. Chargers offense, you got to get yourself some. Whether that's Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, Isaiah Spiller, Mike Williams, Gerald Everett, Joshua oh, yeah. Palmer. Everything out of camp right now has been positive for Palmer. And I'm all with you on this one here. Now, Major, I also like this guy that you're about to throw out here right now because I think he gives the his team a little bit of a different dynamic. Do you want to talk about your next player here as your flex, my guy? Yeah, I'm going with DJ Shark. Um, in 21, I was calling for his breakout. And he was actually having a pretty good season. He had two touchdowns in four games or three and a half. Um, that that fourth game, he actually got injured while blocking. Like most receivers don't do that, so he was actually going hard for another teammate and got hurt um, and kind of ended his season. But you know, rumors out of camp is that he is moving around all positions. He kind of he's in that X position um, and at six four, six three ish, um, and he runs a four four. Um, I think. He's just he has the ability to be the guy. He was kind of coming on as the guy in um in Duval County when before he got hurt. But um I I, I really really think that Jared Goff does not get enough credit. Yes, I know he throws turns over all, the, but he can play the he can play the game and with all these weapons this year. I think uh, DJ Shark is going to have an opportunity to at least be a red zone threat with his height. He's taking advantage of the IR. I think he came in the league at like 185. I think he's a little bit closer to 200 pounds now. So he's doing the work. And I think this is going to, and he's on a one year contract. We all know when players on these one year deals, they actually go out and, and have really good seasons to get that, that big payday. So I'm all in on DJ Shark. I have him pretty much in, every league and if i don't i'm trying to grab him because i think he's going to actually be that wide receiver one in that offense when it's all said and done one year 10 million dollars that's all that the lions invested in him here in the offseason he has a good season we're talking about a former pro bowl player for the jacksonville jaguars here in dj chark the talent is there that is not the question it's the ability to stay on the field that's what we've been questioning here the last couple of seasons You're right now i love this detroit lions offense i really do from DeAndre Swift to Jamal Williams to the wide receivers, TJ yeah. Hawkinson. You got Jamison Williams here who's going to come back here, probably be close yeah, to 100% season. by week eight, week nine. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then DJ Chark, like I said, Amon Ross St. Brown. This is a very talented offense that the Lions have. I mean, I don't want to say they're a top five offense, but there's top five potential in this offense as far as the skill position goes. Jared Goff, as much as we like to ding him, he did take a team or represented a team, quarterback a team in the Super Bowl, right? So we know that he can manage somewhat there. I don't want to call him a game manager because people don't like that term. But a player that I want to talk about now here, we talked about Joshua Palmer. I love him. DJ Chark, he's basically a wide receiver, 135 right now, uh, currently on ADP here on Fantasy Pros. The guy I want to talk about, listen, no one managed to stay healthy a season go in New York. No one. 
Talent is never the question when it comes to Kadarius Tony. He's currently going off as a wide receiver, 48. 112 other players are being selected ahead of him in redraft right now. So, but I, you know, what? I'm not going to focus on the negative. I want to talk about his 2.14 yards per route run, which ranked 11th in the league, and his missed tackles forced per reception, 0.31. That led all receivers. You saw him against the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, the dude absolutely lit it up against the Cowboys there for 189 yards back last October there. When the ball gets into Tony's hands, good things are going to happen. However, he's got to stay on the field. So if you take his two yards per route run and he sees 100 targets here next season, then 100 uh, – a thousand yards receiving that should be attainable for him. And I'll take this one step further here and I'll go out on the limb here. Maybe strip a little bit of controversy here. Maybe not quite as much as uh, Michael Pittman's not an alpha in Indianapolis, but I will say right now, Kadarius Tony will average more fantasy points per game this season than a J Brown. So yeah, I'm, I'm crazy. Oh, Tara, I'm saying, Tara, for real, I'm are you fantasy points per game? Wait, no, Tara didn't give you the eyebrow. She gave you the uh, maybe. No, Do you explain know how many? Explain this. Throw a stat at you. No, explain. There's a very possible way. There's a path for him to do this. I just told you. 2.14 yards per route run. If he sees a hundred targets, he's easily going to have a thousand yards. Are you worried about Kenny Galladay, Sterling Shepard, <laughs> Wandell Robinson? I'm now not that you said any that, of those this guys. is going to be the year that Galladay actually like plays a whole <laughs> season. Yeah, he's only a couple seasons removed from having good seasons back in Detroit before his hip oh. injury started to flare up suddenly. <laughs> now you're looking at that, and now we talk about the Philadelphia Eagles here. AJ Brown is still going to compete for targets with Devontae Smith. He's going to right. have to be efficient. That's going to be the key there in Philadelphia is being efficient with your opportunities. Kadarius Tony. He's going to get peppered. He's going to get those targets. And I, I really think he's going to have more fancy points per game. Not more, perhaps not more fancy points over the season because Tony does have a little bit of an injury history here, but so does I really like Tony here. And when you were where you're getting him compared to some of these top wide receivers, you're getting him in the eighth and ninth round of a lot of fantasy drafts right now. And he is the Giants wide receiver one, in my opinion. So why not take a shot at him right now? There's some upside to be had. Now, hey, I said if time is allowed, we'll give wait, a couple wait, honorable mentions have, Tara, here. Hold on. Tara had to defend her, like, agreeing with you on some crazy take. Major, what do you think that A.J. Brown averaged last year per game? You know, I don't even look at a stat. <laughs> like, it's kind I don't, of important when we're talking about fantasy football here. Well, I, don't I, don't analysis. Do stat. I don't do stat. <laughs> I don't do it. I just, I just do well, how do players' you, abilities and their skills. Go ahead. What do I think that A.J. Brown had uh, on a points-per-game basis? Mm-hmm. 9.8? 14. Oh, major. 13.9. Yeah. There you go. Ability I don't think that's going to be that hard for Tony to beat if he acts like per per game, as you said. What? Yeah. A nice little caveat just kind of sprinkled in there. A little bit of a hedging on that prediction, so to speak. It seems like Tony has that thing, though, kind of like, um, you know, those receivers that is that like A-B in them, a little A-B, a little uh, like Gordon, a little just can't get right. Like he's going to end up fighting yeah. or doing something weird. It's something about him that's just not all the way there. He's probably going to be fantastic, but he's probably going to miss a few games just off of like that <laughs> – that little thing that I don't know what it is. It's just something that's off a little bit, you know? And that's why we say points per game on this one. <laughs> now, Touché. Is there anyone here that I'm missing? Tara, I'll start with you. Is there anyone that you want to kind of give a little bit of an honorable shout out to? Um, you know, we can do a, you know what? You did uh, kind of pique my interest on a tight end. We can do an honorable shout out to, uh, to Irv Smith. For sure. Um, I mean, Irv Smith, you know, and I think sometimes people get a little bit um, jaded on Irv Smith because when you think about it, you kind of say, okay, there's a lot of talent. There's clearly Justin Jefferson. He's got to compete with. He's got to compete with Adam Thielen, who when healthy is obviously just an absolute monster in terms of touchdowns. Um, then there's obviously the strong presence on the ground as well. And, you know, 
the offense that is coming over the history that they have over there in LA with, you know, Tyler Higby, if you kind of reference that and you can kind of do the math and I can see where people make the argument that Irv Smith might not have a lot of upside, but I think the talent level is just a lot different. And when you look at what he did in 2020, he was um, kind of in the back half. I don't have it in front of me, but I think it was like five touchdowns in that kind of back half area when he was finally healthy. He had a good connection with Kirk Cousins. I think that they're going to obviously increase the pass volume. They're going to focus more on attacking through the air. And I think that Irv Smith is going to be a beneficiary. I think he could have a, he might not have the target volume and the yards volume, but I think it might be kind of similar to a Dawson Knox kind of season. So I do like Irv Smith a lot this year. Irv Smith is one of those true, will promise meet production type plays for fantasy right now. There's all kinds of promise there. We see the potential there, but will it meet production? Now, Major, give me one more or two more guys here just off the top of your head that fantasy managers should be targeting ahead of their redraft leagues. Yeah, I'm going to go three real quick. I love Isaiah Spiller. I think that um, Eckler is most likely on his way on a decline. Probably not all the way there yet, but he runs extremely hard. Like, like he runs so hard. I think he's like injury prone just because he, he goes so hard. So Spiller is taking reps with first team uh, in, in, in camp. He's the only other running back to do that besides um, – before I mentioned, uh, I can't even think I smoke too much, but OBJ, <laughs> my second guy, OBJ, he, he, uh, there's, there's opportunity now. Um, Van Jefferson just went down with an energy uh, injury. I don't know how bad it is, but I think this is going to be the thing to get the Rams to do whatever they have to do to get OBJ in. And I think people kind of forget, like he was the man in that, in, in the Super Bowl before he got hurt and in, in that playoff game before that, he was actually uh, the favorite coming out of that slot. And then uh, someone that no one's talking about, or at least I haven't heard of it, but James Porsche out there in Baltimore, he's having a really good camp as well, uh, playing a slot receiver. Uh, Bateman is going to be that clear cut alpha receiver out there. He has no other competition, but these quarterbacks who kind of have, like a vertically challenged game. And I think um, Jackson is working on it, but I don't think he's there yet. So the check downs are going to be lovely. And Porsche is going to be one of those uh, slot receivers who's going to get peppered with a lot of targets. So uh, look, look, look for him to be that wide receiver to in that offense. Well, I'm going to let a couple comments there slide <sighs> just because I know that, you know, you're take you've took some medicine here before the show, and I, I don't want that to affect this, your comments here too much here. So the one guy for me, hey, this is a show about my guys, right? So we can't go a show here without talking about one of my guys, and right. it is Jacoby Myers sliding that one in here because hey, I'm the last man standing when it comes to the Jacoby Myers mountain. I have seen everyone jump off, and I get it. Hey, if you're afraid of that. It is. I'm not worried about Devontae Parker. I got zero concern about Devontae Parker. Zero. Now, you're talking about Myers as being one of the most underappreciated receivers in fantasy last season. He's currently going off as a wide receiver 57. And I get it. Two touchdowns. That, that'll hurt you a little bit. But if you take a deeper look inside these numbers, with a first-year quarterback there with McCorkle Jones, Myers had a 23.6% target share along with a 66% catch rate. His targets per route run was roughly about 26, while his route percentage was 91. If Jones can continue to progress as a passer, then Myers can see his production tied in directly to the uh, tra upward trajectory of Mac Jones. Myers led the team last year in receptions, targets, and yards. And I'm not worried about Kendrick Bourne. I'm not worried about Devontae that Parker. Like now, I don't think these guys are all going to be huge producers here in this offense. We talk about very game-specific offense being run here in New England. I think Jacoby Myers is in line for about 900 yards receiving, and I think he's going to have five or six touchdowns. I think he's going to increase on that touchdowns, which had him roughly around wide receiver 35 last year. I think he could push towards that wide receiver 30, and when you're looking at him going off as a wide receiver 57, 
That is value right there. So, hey, I'm all in on Jacoby Myers. And the last thing that I'm in on, before anyone can respond to me right now, is, hey, <laughs> as we hit a new season, we're turning the page on another year when it comes to fantasy football. But you know what else turned the page? Both Tara and Major on the weekend, they turned another page in the year of life <laughs> as they both <laughs> celebrated their birthdays. So from me to them, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Major and Tara. Happy birthday to you. And this has been the Dynasty Vipers Viper Cast, episode 141, presented by the oh, Fantasy Points Media Group. Before you before you end it, shout out to you for you know being the second, what was it, the second rated uh drafter in the uh, all of history of sports what, what was that award you got the other day <laughs> well i was trying to slide through this whole show though talking about that because you know i don't yeah, like you to have talk to talk about, about yourself a little bit man somehow some way hey a broken clock is right twice a day and even a blind squirrel will find a nut from time to time yeah. so somehow some way i managed to end up being the number two rank expert when it comes to the fantasy pros accuracy rankings I don't know how. I don't know what that actually means when it's all said and done. But with that all being said, hey, I'm just happy to be here. So we'll see you next week. We got plenty more content coming at you this week from the top five assets here for each and every team in the NFL. So you want to make sure to check that out on the Vipers Network. Make sure you are subscribed. Make sure you got those notifications on because you do not want to miss what we have coming at you here in the very near future. And head over to DynastyVipers.com. Check out the latest articles, all kinds of content being produced over there. I think there's something like 64 articles, 40-some videos here being released between the next little while. So, I mean, it's crazy but content going down there. So you do not want to miss that. And we'll see you next time. Now can we leave, Major? Actually, one more. Juju Smith-Schuster is balling out right now. That's another guy you got to keep an eye on in the show. And edit it. <laughs> <laughs>